I'll just tell you one story. There's a young woman in San Jose who told me that she couldn't get out of bed. She was physically bedridden, but she would just look at the meetings and be like, maybe I'll go to the noon and then maybe I'll go to the six. And that just scrolling that list helped her in a way that other approaches wouldn't have helped. I think that we're, as a fellowship, learning how to kind of bring things like these virtual meetings, which are lifesavers to certain people, you know, able to kind of bring that to people and say, we can meet you where you are now. Uh, it's so important. I heard it through the grapevine. Welcome. It's the AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour, featuring the collected voices of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Don, an alcoholic in Greensboro, North Carolina. Hey, Don. Hey, everybody. I'm Sam, an alcoholic in Palm Springs, California. Hiya, Sam. Hey, we got a letter from Todd K. in Huntley, Illinois. We sure did. Todd writes, howdy. I like the opening. First things first, I love this podcast and have listened to it since its inception. I typically listen to it on a Monday morning while I'm out running. It's become my meeting on the run. A topic you touched on in a 2022 Half Hour Variety Hour podcast is the difficulty of reestablishing our AA program after moving to a new side of town, city, or state. I know this subjectively because I've made seven interstate moves in sobriety. It's never easy. I also know it objectively because I've seen members, often with long-term sobriety, move into town and attend meetings for a short time, and then poof, they disappear. Moving can be just as dangerous as hanging out in slippery places for the recovering alcoholic. A couple of years ago, I actually submitted an article to The Grapevine on this very topic. Just wanted to pass this topic along for your consideration. He has a note at the end, sent via cage-free carrier pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Yeah, I, I sent him a note back that we received a letter by Al. And I hope that his carrier pigeon wasn't harmed in the exchange. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have experience with moving to a new area. I got sober here in Greensboro. But I've, you know, know what it's like to go out of town and to a new place for weeks at a time. And I need to go to meetings when I'm out of town, and I know the difficulty in doing it. It's kind of like when I went to my very first meeting, for some reason, out mm -hmm. of town, I have to walk through a wall to go to a new meeting where I've never been and introduce myself. Well, Don, most of us have to walk through a wall, but we use the door. Well, that's what the problem is. It's like <laughs> I had to, again and again and again, I'm hitting that wall. Try the door handle, huh? It'll, it'll work. No, better. no, no. I use the door. <laughs> but it's, well, I mean that emotionally it's difficult. There's an yeah. element of fear. Absolutely. And, you know, that totally takes me to that saying about fear that I absolutely love that fear is a mile high and a mile wide, but paper thin. Yeah. And if, if we just walk through it, I was talking with my sponsor this week, talking about becoming a part of and moving to a new locale and going to new meetings or to fellowship after meetings is, is weird. It's like, I've got little mm. chill bumps talking about this because I've experienced this having moved a couple years ago now. Don, this was back when you and I were meeting for coffee after the men's meeting in Greensboro on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. A uh, former sponsee of mine joined us after coffee. He and I were walking out together to his car and he was talking about how he kind of didn't feel a part of the fellowship at the coffee shop didn't know what was going on. And, and I'm like, yes, but if you come back next week, you're going to be up on the stuff that we talked about this week. Right. And that builds on itself and you become a part of. I was telling my sponsor about that because that's what I needed to do here as well. It's uncomfortable to go to those meetings repeatedly for the first several times because I don't know people well, and I'm not in on the 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 joke or all the other stuff. I don't know what's going on. The social conventions of the local yes. area, yeah, and or even just the, the what's been going on, what's happening, what happened yeah. last week. Yeah. But if I go regularly, then I become a part of, and I'm also informed and can be a part of the conversation much more comfortably. And 
you allow yourself to be known by them so that that the group can include you in on it. Yeah. And then I really began to feel a part of the group. And it happened to me when I worked. I worked for many, many years out of town in Colorado. And eventually those meetings became just as comfortable for me as the meetings here in Greensboro. And I looked forward to them and I looked forward to seeing my friends. Yeah, there. absolutely. Now it used to be, it was a little bit more difficult to find the meetings because you'd have to go on the internet, look up where the meeting is. If the website was updated, you know, I might look on the website and this happened to me. I went to a meeting that started a half hour later and was a woman's meeting. And <laughs> <laughs> that's not what was listed because, you know, whoever was taking care of the website hadn't updated it. Or you try and find the meeting, can't find the address, get kind of lost. Like, oh, am I in a bad part of town? I don't know. It's like a lot of fear around things like that. It seems to be easier now than it used to be. I bet our guest is going to be able to provide a little insight onto why that's a little easier today. Why is that? We'll get there. So folks, today we're going to be talking with Josh R. from Mountain View, California. And we'll see if we can interest him in some uh, discussion based on hashtag heard in a meeting posts. Grapevine does not accept donations, but you can offer your support by making a purchase at store.aagrapevine.org or by the Carry the Message gift certificates to sponsor Grapevine subscriptions for alcoholics in need. That's store.aagrapevine.org. Hey, I'm Josh. I'm an alcoholic, and I am from Mountain View, California, and my home group is the In the Basement group on Sunday nights. Josh, thank you so much for joining us. So you've been sitting here listening to us prattle on about all of this. And what are your thoughts about why it's so much easier to find a meeting these days and have the information be current? Yeah. So the whole topic is more than just that, but the the topic about moving also really ties oh, in yeah. my yeah. story. I moved out to California from New York City in 2013, and I was drinking a lot and kind of living on borrowed time. I kind of felt like I was in a leaky boat. You know, every day was just a little bit harder than the day before. Mm -hmm. I did what we call in the program a geographic and I moved to California. Normally we say we don't recommend this. So, you know, stay where you are, get sober there, go to a meeting there. But in this case, I'd moved out to California and I could not find my way to the nearest meeting because I didn't know where all the place names were. You know, I was mm -hmm. living at that time in Cupertino and I didn't know if Sunnyvale was closer to me than Milpitas or San Jose. And so I would find myself pinching and zooming on this website that was really hard to use. And I would be trying to copy and paste into Google Maps and see, oh, this one's 10 miles away. Oh, this one's two miles away. Yeah. So in early sobriety, I got really involved in trying to improve that experience. I uh, worked on my local website, which was asanjose.org. And then that turned into work on this WordPress plugin that a lot of groups are using, like New York City and Chicago and Seattle. And then that also later turned into creating the Meeting Guide app. And so I created that app that is hooked into a kind of ecosystem of data you know, that's always updating. Mm -hmm. And then um, it can present your closest meeting. You don't need to learn which intergroup is the closest or which city is the closest. It'll just figure that out for you and show it to you in a list. It's really cool. It is awesome. And I've really enjoyed working with it because I learned about it when I saw your presentation at National AA Technology Workshop. And I went back to my district where I was webmaster and said, we've got to do this thing. And we did and have loved following this as it has progressed over these years. But one of the things that's so super cool about it, Josh, is that the people who are closest to the information are the ones who update it. That's right. You and others like you were really in invaluable. I mean, you were essential to creating this system because 
all these different groups, they're connected now. I say they because GSO now runs the Meeting Guide app, but mm -hmm. the, you know, it's connected to hundreds and hundreds of AA websites. And it's people like you, sometimes it's a technology person, other times it's an intergroup manager or someone like that who makes a decision to get connected. And sometimes, usually this involves upgrading their website and doing things in a different way and having a different way of managing the meeting listings. Uh, but once that's set up, then any changes they make locally on their website get automatically propagated up to the app. They don't need to remember to like upload a spreadsheet or something like that every week. It gets every 12 hours, it checks for updates. But in order to get all that to work, we had to start at just seven websites that were originally connected back in 2015 it launched. And so it was, you know, like the San Jose website, the San Francisco website, the Philadelphia website, but not a lot of other places. You know, New York City wasn't, you know, in there, Chicago, Los Angeles. And it took a lot of persuasion and getting comfortable. There was a trust that had to be built. And some people like you who'd met me in person kind of felt comfortable doing this, but others took a lot longer to persuade. Yeah, I really love this solution. It's really elegant. It's a beautiful app the way it is. Now, how did it end up going? So GSO runs mm -hmm. it now. You ran it for a while. Yeah, I mean, really it was, there's a World Service board member named Bo B. And he was really instrumental in kind of persuading World Services to take it on. Basically, they just made a decision to create an app, I think was the first thing. And then he had reached out to me. We knew each other from regional forums. And I said, well, you know, we're a nonprofit. Obviously, we're not making money from this. If you created your own app, we would feel uncomfortable maintaining the app that we have because we don't want to compete with you. We're only a service to AA. So we'd like to just give you this app. And the app itself isn't really the hard thing. You know, the app is one little piece of it. It's really the groups that are maintaining the data. And so World Service has taken that on and they've hired a digital product manager and they've hired some consultants, you know, to kind of manage that relationship and do the support that's required to kind of keep these central offices and areas and districts connected to the app. So how does a group that is not connected to the meeting guide app? So the first thing is that they need to really be an area or a district or an intergroup or some other service entity that's on AA near you on AA.org. And then you need to have a public website that lists meetings and that those meetings need to be listed in a way that the meeting guide can get access to the data. Well, it sounds like a group really needs to be connected with their inner group for the local area. And then local area is the one that makes the decision. That's right. If someone wants to uh, find more information, uh, you can go directly to aa.org slash meeting dash guide dash app, or just search aa.org, then meeting guide. And that page will show up. And it's a lot of information there for getting connected too. So Josh, when did you get sober? My sobriety date is June 20th of 2013. What was going on with you inside that yeah. got you to go to an AA meeting? And it's a pretty drastic thing to do. I mean, <laughs> it sure is. So I had moved out to California in January. I drank in California for about six months. I was trying to control the drinking, but I didn't know that many people. I think that I kind of did like an informal first step, basically. It was my birthday on June 11th of 2013, and I was drinking by myself and I was thinking, you know, this is at the same time as good as it's ever really going to be for me. And also, uh, this is terrible, you know? And so I, I realized at that time that I was never really going to be able to control the drinking the way that I had always kind of been trying to. So I decided that I would go to a meeting and I went to a couple and didn't really talk to anybody, but it was a particular meeting I went to on a Monday at the Saturday Night Live group where I met my sponsor. This guy, Larry C., came up to me, very nice affect, and he just said, you know, do you have a plan? What are you going to do? You introduced yourself as a newcomer. Uh, do you need a temporary sponsor? 
it was very out of the normal way for me to say what I said, which was, no, I don't have a plan. And yes, I do need help. Mm. And uh, so we went to a men's meeting after that. And we started meeting up at the local coffee shop. We were both lightly employed at that time. And so, (laughs) you know, we had a lot of time. We could meet up in this coffee shop and talk and work steps. And that's how things came together for me. So had you tried to quit drinking prior to this? Yeah, I'd I'd originally come to AA through an outpatient program that I did in New York City. I'd been to a couple meetings. I had even gotten a little bit of dry time, but I'd never gotten a sponsor or worked the steps. You know, that didn't take. I was grateful for what I had at that time. And my life certainly got better just by not drinking and making friends at meetings and talking about Mm -hmm. my story. But for me, it took relocating getting a sponsor, starting at step one and taking it from there. Step one being we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. So what do you think changed in you or was working in your mind when you said, I don't have a plan? You know, because so many people, what is the difference Mm -hmm. when you come into air and you stay and when you came in and didn't stay? During that time that I started drinking again, after I'd gotten a little bit of that dry time, I had this in my head that I hadn't tried hard enough, that, oh, I was depressed then, I needed to quit drinking, that makes sense, but that now that things are going better, I think that I can control this. I think that I can just have three, you know, I can not drink on weeknights. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of had all these arbitrary rules And things went downhill for me pretty quickly. And I had a lot of denial going on about how bad things were. I was saying, I'm controlling it as well as I possibly can at this point. If I put everything into it, I can stop at three. But what I can't do is I can't stop wanting to keep going. Mm. And I realized at that point that that was never going to change. And that, you know, yeah, I could drag myself away from the bar on a weeknight after an acceptable number of drinks, but I could never stop wanting that to just have 12 to 15 and fall asleep. I so relate to that. I, you know, what popped into my mind while you were sharing that was the statement in the big book about if you have doubts, go and try some controlled drinking. And you proved to yourself that you can't do it in a way that works for you. That's right. Having had that thought, then I went to this meeting and I met the sponsor and I was like, if nothing changes, nothing changes. And I need to do things differently now. And so I was ready to accept uh, suggestions. You know, I had that gift of desperation that I needed to really do it differently. What was one of the things that AA or your sponsor asked you to do that seemed unreasonable, yet you did it and then discovered that it worked? Um, I think that the God higher power stuff was difficult for me. I was not raised in any kind of religious or spiritual context at all. And so I really had no idea how to approximate that. I worked at that a lot with my sponsor talking about God and higher power and We got to a place that I think is pretty good, but is sort of the best that I can do because I just, I have a hard time believing in things, but I, I can see the kind of concrete evidence in my own life. And I truly believe that this isn't something that I can do by myself, that I do need the fellowship. And so he suggested doing a 90 and 90. And so I did that. Which means going to 90 meetings in 90 days. That's right. Yeah. That's completely unreasonable. I can't imagine (laughs) anyone would ever do that. (laughs) Except we do, right? (laughs) You know, I think that faith really doesn't matter. What I believe about my higher power doesn't matter. What matters is the action I take. That's right. Faith follows action. So it's the action that I take. This has happened to me again and again, never in the moment, rarely in the moment. Looking back, I can say, oh, okay, I can see how the fact that I was willing to surrender and ask for help 
that I was I got through situations that I could never have gotten through before and would have had to drink. But I don't. I don't have to drink anymore. Yeah. Well, I took this program on the faith in the word of the people who were telling me that it worked for them. So I trusted them sharing their experience. And I'm like, okay, well, what I'm doing is not working and I want to kill myself. I think I'll try it. And I tried it. And as I continued doing it, I had my own experiences so that I didn't even have to have faith because I have experience now that is mine that this works. And so I keep doing it. Josh, what's so how do you stay sober today? What are the actions that you take? Mm -hmm. I go to meetings and that's a big part of it for me. I'm so grateful to be able to go to in-person meetings again. Mm -hmm. uh, I also still am doing a lot of technology service that I'm not directly involved in the app itself anymore, but I am very directly involved in keeping other groups connected to it. And so I've been working uh, just today with Topeka and other groups recently. I work with the online intergroup with their online meeting list. What's that website? It's aa-intergroup.org slash meetings is their meeting finder. I developed this kind of new approach to it. You know, it's got meetings from all around the world. And the cool thing that it does is it normalizes the time zones so that if I go to it in California at 1030 on a Saturday morning, the next meeting, you know, could be in London but it has changed wow. the time zone so that I see it in my time zone and it's nice. organized. My brain goes into a jelly when I try to figure out these time zones. I need to call Sam. Wait, what time is it where Sam is? Wait, wait I, I, it's hard. I'm glad that you're working out algorithms to take care of things like this. Yeah, I saw some really positive feedback from Australia right after this thing launched where they were like, this is so great because you can't believe, I mean, we don't even know what day it is when we're trying to find the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Terrific. Josh, we've got something special coming for you. Now it's time for Number Sign Hurt Eating. <laughs> and today's show is brought to you by the number 12. Don. Okay, I understand where you're going. The number 12, 12 steps, 12 traditions, but it's hashtag heard in a meeting. Oh. Yes. This is where we scour the interwebs for your posts of cool things you've heard in a meeting. Post them on social media with hashtag heard in a meeting, keeping in mind our tradition of anonymity. Here's what caught our attention this week. Let's spin the wheel of hashtag heard in a meeting. <laughs> AA is a one-room schoolroom where everyone is allowed to be where they are at. Ooh, that goes back to your childhood, right, Don? The one-room schoolhouse? <laughs> <laughs> That's a little far back. We did have cloak rooms, but it wasn't... <laughs> We need to bring cloaks back. Yes, totally. That's one of the things I love about A in many ways is when I go to a meeting, I don't know what I'm going to get. And you and I could both go to a meeting together and we would walk out with different messages. I don't know what the message is that I'm going to hear at a meeting. And it could come from somebody who's been sober for 65 years. Is that possible? Or it could come from somebody who's been sober for 60 days. I mean, you just don't know. And as we say, it's a we program. We're all wrecked in the same boat. We all have the same problem. And we're all seeking the same solution and help each other to find it. I love the school metaphor. I'm always learning things when I'm in meetings. And a lot of times I'm learning things about myself. I'm remembering things in a different way. I'm remembering, you know, oh, I used to do that too. And I never thought of myself as somebody who does that. You know, I used to be so sick or I'm still got some areas of improvement. I think that we're all kind of in school together. I like that. Let's see, what are we going to do next? I don't understand God. So I don't say the God of my understanding. Instead, I say the God of my experience. Oh, yeah. Josh, you have a thought on that right off the bat? Well, you said something earlier that I thought spoke to that about how the faith is in the doing. 
something I heard from my sponsor was you can't think your way into right action, but you can act your way into right thinking. Mm -hmm. Don, any thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's entirely my experience. And I was very hung up because our third step says made a decision to turn our will and lives over to the care of God as we understood him. And being hung up on understanding him was a real obstacle for me. And what I really needed to do was to move on through the steps. It is at the end of the steps, the last step, 12th step, having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, looking back on the whole experience, something happened to me. And what happened to me was bigger than me. And so what I do is I allow that that is God, that is my higher power at work in my life by me working the steps. You know, as an atheist, I use the word God as shorthand, and I really like how that works for me because I don't need you to understand what that means to me, and I don't need to understand what that word means to you. It just works so that we can communicate and talk about it. I love that I'm in a place that I don't even have to define what that shorthand stands for. Because again, you know, I've got the experience that I've, I've had. And I just do things that I have been learning to do in these rooms, and my life continues to get bigger and bigger. I love that statement, something about pack into the stream of life. Yeah. You know, that is my life today. I was talking one time with Gary H., who's the intergroup manager for Hill Country Intergroup. I get to meet a lot of cool people doing this service, and uh, okay. he's a religious or a spiritual person. And I, I told him I was struggling and he told me this beautiful story, which I'm going to totally mess up. It was about a lamplighter in Paris and how the streets were foggy and this lamplighter would light the lamps. And he didn't know what the lamplighter looked like because of the fog in the streets, but you could see where he'd been and that God was like that, that that experience that you have, you look back and you see, oh, you know, this has really been working in my life, even though I may not understand or I may not fully accept certain ideas that other people might have about what that looks like. I love that. I was listening to Anne L. talk recently, and she said, the path of recovery is a well-lit path. And it's well lit because so many people have walked it before and can show me the way. And it's pretty wide, too. It's wide. Yeah, it's a boulevard. A broad highway, even. What, you could say that. <laughs> yeah. Josh, is there anything that you want to share that we didn't get to? One thing I'd love to do would just be to tell people that if they were developers that wanted to get into service... AA has got a lot of opportunities. And one way to do that is to go to codeforrecovery.org because that's where people can find out about our Zoom meetings that we do. And it's a lot of AA members that get together and work on websites and that that service can have a really far-reaching impact. Codeforrecovery.org. So that's C-O-D-E, the number four, recovery.org. That's right. Josh, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you. The Grapevine is looking for your story submissions. AA in the military. Stories are due February 15th, 2023. Did you ever serve in the military sober? Were you ever stationed overseas or on a ship while trying to stay sober? What were AA meetings like in the military? What were some of the challenges? Did you find AA while serving? Share your story by February 15, 2023 via aagrapevine.org slash share. Hi, my name's Joe. I'm an alcoholic from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. I got a joke for you guys. Jim is sitting at a meeting next to his sponsor, and he's restless and distracted. His sponsor asks, What's wrong with you? Ugh, I'm bored. Well, you know why you're bored. It's because you're boring. 
Now for Jim, this was a mind-blowing experience. It opened up his eyes and he was like rocketed into the fourth dimension. Like, oh my God, that was an amazing revelation. And Jim thinks, I can't wait to use this on the newcomer. So 13 years later, Jim is in a meeting and Sally comes up and sits next to him. And Sally is restless and distracted. And Jim asks, Sally, what's wrong? <sighs> I'm bored. Hmm. You know why you're bored? Yeah, because I'm with you. <laughs> 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 it's really not that funny. Thanks for joining us. The AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour is posted every Monday and is produced by AA Grapevine Inc. We don't speak for AA as a whole. We share the experience, strength, and hope of members to help others recover from alcoholism. Podcast info, including how to call in, is at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. Find AA Grapevine on Instagram and the AA Grapevine channel on YouTube. All things Grapevine are available at aagrapevine.org. If you want to know more about AA, Google Alcoholics Anonymous and your city or visit aa.org.